Hi, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 45. I'm Andy and we are continuing to talk about unsafe stuff. Some of this stuff is outside of my comfort zone, but I'm doing my research, so hopefully um, I'll have useful things to say. Uh, this time we're going to look at some examples of like what unsafe code you might come across or you might need to write yourself. So we'll start by looking at raw pointers. So imagine we've got uh, a number, I32, called x. Um, and then we make a pointer to it. So the way we make a pointer is we make a reference to x, and then we say as star mute i32, and this star mute i32, that is a pointer to a mutable i32. So now y is a pointer to a mutable i32. We also make a, just a, an i32 called z, just a normal one, and then we do some unsafe stuff. So the unsafe stuff we do is we write something into y. So y is a mutable pointer. That means you can change the underlying data pointed to by it, so we can do this point to write. Um, we can say write the contents of Z into Y, and then when we read from it, we get back 12. Um, and you can have as many of these pointers as you like pointing at stuff, and we take them um, because like reading from and writing to them is unsafe, so you have to follow the rules. Whereas normally Rust will um, make sure you you only ever have one mutable reference to something, and no immutable references at the time you've got a mutable reference. Um, but with pointers, you can do you can do what you like, but you've got to follow the same rules about um, pointers must be valid before you can uh, read them and stuff like that. So uh, you're kind of on your own and you need to like read the docs carefully about how to use them, but you this is something you can do in unsafe and you might find yourself doing. Uh, another type that you might well come across if you're doing unsafe stuff is non-null. This is um, basically like a, a convenience wrapper around a pointer, um, which says this is a pointer which is not null. Um, and there's, it has this constructor new unchecked, which just assumes that you, you have checked yourself that the thing is not null. Um, uh, and so the, the compiler won't check it, it will just assume, and therefore it'll feel free to dereference it, I guess. Um, and that was, it will crash if um, it is now. So here we're breaking the rules. We're saying uh, make uh, a number x and then make a non-null pointer out of it by calling new unchecked. Um, and actually x is zero, right? So this is incorrect. Like not null means zero in this case. So um, we're breaking the rules. We're also breaking the rules here by using this way of making a null pointer, right? We're saying std putter null mute, which means make me uh, a null pointer to mutable stuff. Uh, and then we're making a non-null out of it. Um, don't do it. So basically, if you do either of those things, um, you can get undefined behavior. You can't predict how your program is going to behave. Um, so if you call new unchecked, make sure you know it definitely is not zero, definitely is not null. Um, but that can be useful one. If you know that your pointer is not null, wrapping it in this non-null thing can mean that you don't have to check it uh, every time you use it and stuff like that. So can be good. Okay, something else you're going to uh, potentially work with if you're um, doing unsafe stuff is maybe uninit. So normally variables in Rust are always pointing at valid memory that has been set up correctly and contains one of the things. You can never be looking at like a bool uh, but actually it contains random bytes instead of um, just either 0 or 1, which is what a bool always contains. Um, maybe uninit is a way of saying I want some memory which has not yet been um, filled with the right stuff um, because I'm going to work with it, and then when it, once it is filled with the right stuff, I'm going to turn it into a, a safe type. So this is another example of a thing you shouldn't do. So you can make a maybe uninit by calling maybe uninit uninit, which makes... And maybe on init, which definitely is uninitialized, um, because maybe on init could be initialized, could be not. Um, so make one that's definitely not initialized. Basically, get me get me a bit of memory, um, and then if we call assume init on it, um, we're basically lying to the compiler. We're saying take this thing that I know is uninitialized and treat it as if it is initialized. So that's undefined behavior. So that's not the way you should be using maybe on init, and this will again cause your program to behave in a completely unpredictable way. Um, but yeah, maybe on it can be useful when you're working with pointers. For example, here's an implementation of a swap function, um, which takes in two pointers and is unsafe 
because there are rules about when you're allowed to call this or not call this. Perhaps that X and Y can't be equal or something like that. Um, and then it does some unsafe stuff inside. So this is the type of unsafe we were talking about where we declare to the person calling us, you must read the docs and follow the rules. And this is the type of unsafe, uh, the other type of unsafe that we talked about, which is I'm doing something dangerous, but I have read the docs and I'm following the rules and I must declare above um, what I'm doing that means that this is safe. So what we're saying here is um, we're doing a copy non-overlapping um, of from X to temp, and then a normal copy, which might be overlapping from Y to X, and then a copy non-overlapping from temp to Y. So the point of copy non-overlapping is um, the runtime, this code, the copy copy non-overlapping function doesn't need to check whether these two ranges are overlapping or not, um, because you're telling it they definitely are not overlapping. That's what this non-overlapping part in the name means. So this is why this is, needs to be in an unsafe block, because you have to guarantee that X and temp are not overlapping. Uh, and this, this safety comment is basically saying, we know that temp and X don't overlap because I've just made temp. So it must be a new bit of memory. Uh, so it can't overlap with either X or Y because I've made a whole new thing. Um, by the way, the size of the uninitialized memory, memory we've made is basically the, the size of this T, um, which is the, so you, this is a function that can swap any type of thing. Um, and it just, the temp, temp is basically big enough to fit one of those things, whatever that thing is. And then we can tell the compiler, go fast, because I know that X and temp don't overlap. But then go a bit slower, because I don't know whether X and Y overlap. And then go fast again, because I know that temp and Y uh, don't overlap. And that ends up with X and Y swapped, and then temp gets dropped. Um, and the point is, we didn't bother initializing a T in temp. We saved our, the time for the compiler, because we knew we were immediately going to copy over temp with the contents of X. So there was no need for us to waste time initializing a T in the first place. Um, so that's why it's useful to have this uh, maybe uninit call. Um, notice, by the way, that actually creating uh, some uninitialized memory is not actually unsafe. We're not in an unsafe block here. Um, but calling um, the copy non-overlapping, um, these calls are unsafe. Um, Okay, so that's just an example of how you might use maybe uninit. Um, basically, save yourself the, the work of initializing a T, uh, or maybe you don't even know how to initialize a T, um, because you know that T is immediately going to get overwritten with some valid memory, basically. All right, so uh, another type you might look at is C string, which is... Um, a, a string which is suitable for using when talking to C code or something which uses C ABIs. So a string in C code is always a bunch of bytes and then a zero uh, or a null byte. Um, whereas in Rust, that's not the memory layout of a string. Um, we actually looked earlier on about what the memory layout of str and string might be. Uh, or maybe R, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, in C, uh, a string doesn't remember its length or anything like that. It's just... Um, some bytes and then a zero. So a C string basically internally is laid out like that, and you can create one from a str. So what we're doing here is creating a C string uh, from a str. Uh, that might fail. The reason it might fail is because you might pass in a zero byte. If you do backslash zero somewhere in here, um, you might pass in a zero byte. And a zero byte is, is not valid inside a C string. It's only valid at the end of a C string. So that's not allowed. So that's why we got this potential, this way C string new returns a result, which we're just turning into uh, a C string by um, panicking if there was a null in there, because we know there isn't a null in there. So we can just write this little message saying there aren't any null bytes, so we'll never get here, essentially. So now we've got a C string, and now we can use that C string to call into C code. So we've got this strlen function, which we've got from um, the libc module, which which presumably calls into the strlen function in the C standard library. strlen is a C function which measures the length of a string by going through all the bytes until it hits a zero. So we can't pass a normal str to strlen because there isn't a zero at the end. There might not be a zero for millions of bytes or ever or something. So strlen will go wrong. So what we have to do if we want to call strlen is uh, give it a, a string which has a zero at the end, um, and that C string guarantees that there will be a zero at the end, so we can just call as putter on it to get a pointer to the beginning of the C string. We know there's a zero at the end of it, because that's just the way C string is laid out internally. So now we're safe to call strlen, 
Um, so we should have a little safety block here saying, I'm safe to call Strill end because I know C string has a null byte at the end or something like that. And maybe it's just too obvious here. Um, everything's very close together, but, um, I still think we should have a, a function there. Uh, and then this comment here is just telling us what Strill end looks like, right? It's an extern C function as in it's called in some C ABI. In this case, we know, well, it's almost certainly from the, the C standard library. Um, all right. So that's, uh, C string. Uh, guaranteed to have a zero at the end so you can call into C functions. Um, so let's look at some examples, um, of how we might need to do unsafe stuff, um, in order to either interact with other languages or interact with the hardware itself or to do optimization. So let's start with, um, libc function. So this is another example of the C, a function from the C standard library. There is this get pid function in the C standard library. If we want to call that, um, we have to wrap it in unsafe because everything in that C standard library is considered unsafe. So we need to wrap it up in this unsafe block to say, I know what I'm doing, even though I'm calling a, a C function. In this case, I'm not sure this could really go wrong. So maybe unsafe feels a bit unnecessary here, not sure. Um, but it's worth noting that for a lot of these functions, there are actually safe wrappers, right? So std process ID will also get you the process ID of your, um, of your process without needing to do any unsafe because inside, um, these safe wrappers, like std process ID, uh, it makes sure that we're following the rules. Um, other things you might want to do interact with the operating system. For example, executing a program. So we've got, we've got this exec ve function, which takes in a bunch of pointers. So you've got to make sure that these, um, slices of pointers are all correct. That's why this is unsafe because there are rules you need to follow to be able to call exec ve. Um, but then inside exec ve it does various things for different operating systems and stuff like that. Notice it's making a C string here. Um, and it's going to call the underlying uh, standard library function exec ve, um, having like made sure it's got C strings and all the right stuff. Uh, to pass in. So again, interacting with the operating system, um, you need to do some unsafe stuff um, uh, because exec VE is unsafe because you're passing in pointers that might need to be valid and like um, it's going to dereference them and stuff like that. Okay, other things you might do, and now this, this means very little to me, but yeah, interacting with hardware devices on your system, um, you're you may well need to do clever stuff like this assembly language stuff. Um, so you might need to do some inline assembly language to like set some registers or like read from registers or um, like overwrite some kind of volatile bit of memory or something like that. Um, so um, recent Rust does allow you to do assembly language uh, inline, but clearly that's unsafe because you could be doing anything. You could be messing with um, memory or something. So basically you really need to do what you know what you're doing in order to do assembly language stuff. So that's all got to be unsafe. I'm noticing that there's no unsafe block inside this function. Um, I believe in recent rust, even if the function is declared unsafe, you still need to, uh, to do any unsafe stuff inside it in its own unsafe block. But it used to be, and perhaps this, this, um, example is from earlier. Um, where if you said unsafe on a function, everything inside that function was considered uh, unsafe automatically. But um, that's changed, I'm pretty sure. Uh, anyway, so I don't know what any of this means, but if you want to do assembly language, it's unsafe, um, quite obviously. And interacting with the hardware is one example of where you might need to do um, assembly language, which of course would be specific for your um, hardware architecture. Okay, so now let's look at an example of how we might want to optimize um, our code by using unsafe, by doing something in a more efficient way. So let's talk about linked lists. So a linked list is just um, a list of things which um, where we don't know the size and we might need to insert things. So we don't want to use something like a VEC. If you use a VEC for this kind of stuff, you might be frequently inserting new items into the middle of the list. Every time you do that, if your list is stored in a VEC, You've got to shift all the things after it, a long one. That can get really expensive if it's a long list or if you just do a lot of insertions. Um, aside, uh, it because of like cache locality and stuff like that, 
often a VEC is still the best choice, even if you're doing a lot of inserts. But let's assume we know for sure um, we need a linked list. We need something where we don't have to shift all the others along um, when we insert a new thing. Well, the structure of a linked list uh, normally looks something like this. So a linked list is either nil, which means basically empty, or it's the thing that we're storing in the list, which in this case is a U64, um, combined with a pointer to another linked list. Now, you might think it should be just U64 and then linked list here, but that won't work. That would be a recursive structure. The compiler doesn't know how big that is because it goes on forever with linked list inside a linked list inside a linked list inside a linked list. Um, this is okay because this is a box. This is a linked list containing a box, and we know the size of a box. It's like a pointer, right? So it's a, um, this is the, the size of this this chunk of linked list, this, this variant of linked list cons is... Uh, a number, the size of a number, so a U64, which is 64-bit, as in, uh, how many bytes is that? Eight bytes? Uh, and then a pointer. And it's a pointer to another thing that's the same size as that, right? So, um, right, so, um, this, that's the basic structure of a linked list. So you basically, you count all the way through the items of the list until you hit one of them that's nil, and that's the end of the list, right? So it could be any length. And notice that if you add a new item to your linked list, um, you only need to change the uh, the item before to point at you or the, the point the pointer to you and then your the new item that you're making needs to point to the one that used to be after the previous one so you can insert into the middle of a list by just breaking the chain sticking yourself in the middle and then carrying on none of the other items in the list change that's why inserting is cheap anyway um link list uh, uh can be implemented using this kind of structure and then uh, the implementation like make one from a range a range here would be just like a list of numbers that you've got into some other thing, like a VEC. Um, oh no, in this case, no, this is just make a linked list that's, that's the numbers in this range, right? So this would be a range like uh, 17 to 25. Um, make a new linked list by basically saying, um, make a nil to say we're at the end of the list. And then for every um, value in our range, um, overwrite that thing with cons and then the previous list. So basically, um, we're going, we're kind of going backwards. We're saying, first of all, make the end of the list, which is a nil. And then, oh yeah, and then it's, it's going through in reverse, right? Yeah. So it's uh, now saying, get, make me the last item in the list. So we've got a list to say end, no, nil to say end. And then we make a const saying the, the last thing in the list pointing to end. And then we make the previous thing in the list pointing to the one we've just created. And then the previous, 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 still we go back. And now we've got a list which is, um, like a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to a pointer, all the things in the list, and each pointer is like next to it has this number. Um, I've explained that terribly. And then you can do other things like add up all the items in the list by just um, being recursive, right? If it's an empty list, then it, when you add them up, there are zero. And if it's not an empty list, you get hold of the number and then a pointer to the rest of the list, and you add up the number with the result of recursively summing the rest of the list, which of course will return zero if we're at the end. So if we had one, two, three in the list, it would go one and then add up the rest. And then it would come back into here and say two and add up the rest of the list. And then three and add up the rest of the list. And then it would add up three to zero because it were at the end. And then it would add the two to the three in the previous call to sum. And then the one to the uh, five that we already got from adding them up in the previous call and then return. Um, again, I've probably explained that terribly, but this is the way you navigate the, one of these linked list things. You can create one by adding, by creating a load of consists that point down the line, and then you can kind of unpack the list by going through and recursively calling the same function again on, on the, the shorter list, having dealt with the first thing in the list. Uh, very familiar from functional programming if you're used to that, um, but probably terribly explained if you're not. The point of this is, uh, given the um, this memory structure, which can be useful because it's good for inserting stuff without cost. Um, how much memory do we use by building this enum? So, um, let's, uh, let's talk about how enums work in terms of their memory consumption. Basically, the memory consumption of an enum is, um, the longest of all, all the things inside it plus potentially some more memory for um, keeping track of which one of these things is currently uh, in use. 
So let's unpack that a little bit. So one way of thinking about this, now it isn't actually represented this way, but one way of thinking about it, how it could be represented, is something like this. A tag saying which item are we on? Is it a nil or a cons? This link list tag is just like saying which one it is. And then a payload, which is like the actual thing. Now a union is something we don't normally use, but it kind of underlies a lot of um, it underlies the way EDUMs work. A union is a thing from like C and uh, other languages where basically it's either this thing or this thing or possibly other things. And a union definitely is exactly the size of the biggest of these two things. And it's your responsibility with a union to know which one it is, a nil or a con. So this is kind of quite unsafe, right? Because you might be, um, you might be wrong, but you have to keep track of. Uh, whether it's a nil or a cons. Um, and so union is safe then to just, or free, not safe. It, you, the compiler then is free to say, okay, this union is exactly the size of the longest of these variants. And the longest of these is this cons, which is basically eight bytes for a U64 and then eight bytes for a pointer, because this box is a, a pointer. Um, so this, this linked list union thing is 16 bytes. And then this tag, um, I happen to know, is eight bytes. So let's uh, switch to the code that I wrote so I can just show you how I figured this stuff out. So first of all, let's look at, um, in fact, let's look at the union version point, right? So this is the, um, this is the kind of unpacked how you would implement an enum uh, example. And it's a tag and a payload, just like we saw. And I'm using some code that I found on Stack Overflow. Let me just credit that while we're here. So, um, the, uh, this, this, um, uh, gist on the, on the Rust, uh, thing is, uh, this, uh, raw debug function, which lets me just see what's inside stuff. I don't understand it, but thanks to the person who wrote it. Um, so if we go to, yeah, the union, um, all I'm doing is I've written a little program that prints out the size of this linked list, uh, enum that I've, sorry, struct that I've created up here. And then I've made a linked list with one thing in it. So it's the cons of a three and a nil. Um, so it's like the, a list of, of length one, right? It's a three and then a pointer to a thing which just contains like, I am the end of the list. Um, and I've also created one that's just completely empty and I'm printing out the memory representations of both of them. So let's run that. Um, just let it build. And what it says is the size of this thing is 24 bytes. And you can see the first eight bytes are the actual three. And then we got a pointer. Um, no, and then, sorry, and uh, let me think about this. Um, what is the layout of this thing? It is a tag and a payload, right? So there's a tag saying... Um, so yeah, interestingly, it's been reordered a bit because I think the tag's coming second. So the first thing is this payload, which in this case is a cons of the three that we said, like there's a list with three in it, and then a pointer. So I'm guessing, that, well, I'm pretty sure the three is here, this three, uh, and then the pointer is this, and then I think the tag is then this stuff here. So it's been reordered, but basically it needs three uh, eight-bit words eight byte words to, um, to represent this, the tag and then the payload. So tag is just a, a number and it's, it's using eight bytes for the number and then uh, eight bytes for the U64 and eight bytes for the pointer. And the reason why the tag is eight bytes is probably because of alignment. I'm not sure. Um, but it ends up the total size being 24. I also printed out just an empty list and you can see it's the same size here. Um, the, the key thing here is that there's this zero, this pointer, uh, I guess is, is the, is null, basically saying, um, you're not pointing at anything. And the tag, I guess the first bit of this is that the tag is saying this is the first thing, the first tag, which is called nil, um, which means there's nothing in here. So we're using 24 bytes. That's the takeaway message here. 24 bytes to represent this thing. Now, actually, uh, like, because we kind of destructured this into how, how we think it would be implemented, we actually made it worse than it is. Because if we have a look at 
the enum case, so this is the kind of or how you would normally write a linked list if you thought didn't think about it too much. It's just an enum of I'm either at the end of the list or I've got more left. And here's the thing. If we run so basically the same code, like uh, create me a linked list of a three and then nil, or create me a linked list that's just nil, so like an empty list, and then print them out. Let's do that. That was called enum. So let's have a look at what it prints out. Well, so we asked for uh, a list which has got a three and then a nil to say the end of the list. We can see it's 16 bytes in size only. Uh, here's the three. And then the only other thing it's made of is a pointer. And you might say, well, hold on. We need a pointer to um, a linked list, but we also need to know whether this was a nil or a cons, right? Like, how does it know? So what what it's doing is really cleverly it's representing this whole linked list structure, the nil, the const, the u64, and the pointer, um, all in just two words, two 8-bit words. Um, one is just to store that u64, that three value, and then the other is either a pointer that points at the, the next thing, or if it's a null, if it's zero, that means actually we weren't in the const case, we were in the nil case, and it can ignore the other half. So that's what's happening here. We've got... Um, uh, this is the, this is where it's printing out just an empty, completely empty list. So in this nil, um, it's got a null pointer here to say we're in the nil case and therefore you don't need any of this information. Um, and then just random stuff here that doesn't matter because you don't need that information. So it's been really clever about the way it, it represents this structure in memory. So that even though it looks like you need like, uh, a tag to say, it's either nil or cons, and, and space for the U64, and space for a pointer. It's managed to kind of analyze our data structure and understand, well, pointers can never be null, so this box is never going to be null. So if I put a zero in there, that's a sign to me that actually we're in this nil case, we're not in the cons case. So if the details of that throw you off, don't worry about it. Basically, the point is, we've written linked list in the most natural way we could think of, um, and it's been represented incredibly efficiently in memory, uh, more efficiently than if we manually tried to structure it this way. So often, just writing kind of idiomatic Rust is the best way uh, to get the best performance. Um, so that's uh, that. what actually happens when you use uh, this enum is more efficient than how we would do it if we kind of manually implemented the same thing using a tag and a union, which is interesting to know, right? Um, uh, oh, just a note that manually drop basically means um we're not it's not we're not going to um delete this for you so you need to write code that deletes those things um okay and then yeah just the memory layout we talked about right it's basically um eight, like eight bytes for the tag and then 16 bytes for the union because the union is a union of two the longest section of the union is um again two eight byte words and the reason, I guess, like I said, this is purely a guess, but I think the reason why you get a, a full eight bytes being used up just for a tag, which can only be one of two things, is for alignment, which are just me, way of me waving my hands and saying, don't really know. Um, so let's think about another way of implementing a linked list that might be more efficient. Instead of using 16 bytes for every uh, element of this list, um, what if we could be more efficient? So what if we had a linked list with a pointer to a node? Um, and then we can create the list, and basically the last item in the list will be a linked list thing with just a, a null pointer inside it. So basically we don't need to waste memory with that last item saying uh, you get 24 or 16 bytes just to say this is the end of the list. Here we can make one that is only going to take up these 8 bytes for a null pointer. And then the others use this kind of external structure so it basically, if it's not null, then it's one of these things where you've got, again, the actual thing that's stored in the list and then, um, the, like another, another, essentially a linked list is just another pointer, right? So this is just the, the item and then a pointer to, um, and the next node. Um, and you can implement, uh, range and sum in a similar way, but you need unsafe to do stuff. Um, so here, this is not unsafe. You're just saying, make me a box and then like turn it into a pointer and store it in my linked list. So that's fine because we're not dereferencing the pointer. But here, when we're doing stuff with the list, uh, like reading from the pointer, 
Uh, it's unsafe because it might be null, but it's okay. We checked whether it's null and don't do it. And we happen to know if it's not null, it's a valid pointer, right? But um, uh, Rust doesn't know that, which is why we need to wrap it up in an unsafe. Um, but yeah, you can still use this linked list and uh, it works okay, but you have to be careful in your implementation. But people using your linked list won't have to worry about that. So let's have a look at how much memory that uses. So again, here's my pointer version, just the same stuff. And we print out a list of size one and a list of size zero. And when we run that, we get the size of each uh, linked list item is eight. So just a pointer. Now, of course, that's not the size of each element in the list, because actually each element in the list is a node. And a node has got two uh, eight byte things in it, a U64 and a linked list. So maybe I should have printed out the size of node instead of the size of linked list. But it does mean that that ending marker saying, um, this is the end of the list only takes up eight bytes instead of 16. So we've saved a, like, a little bit of memory there. Although if we have a long list, that'll be eclipsed by the fact that all the nodes are still um, 16 uh, bytes themselves. Um, so we'd be very proud of ourselves. We've done some unsafe stuff. We've saved ourselves some memory, done really well. Um, but just to make the point for you that often you don't need to bother with this stuff, let's have a look at this. So this is a completely safe thing, and we'll see how to implement this in the exercises that we're going to get to uh, in one of the future videos. Uh, how about a linked list, which is an option of a box of node? So you might think this is going to take up a lot of memory because you've got to, you've got to have an option which takes, um, uh, like represents the fact that this is either there or not there. Uh, and then you've got a, a box which is a pointer to a thing and then a node which is similar to what we had before. But Rust is clever, right? So basically, let's have a look. So where's my code? So my code for this option is here, option of box of node. So print out the size of a linked list. So let's do that. Oops, that's not how you spell option. Um, so the size of a linked list is eight, the same as the pointer version. And it's represented quite interestingly as, so um, this, this linked list, which has got a three in it, and then it points to something else is the linked list part of it is just a pointer. It's just the eight bytes of a pointer. Uh, it points at this node thing, right, which is somewhere else in memory. That's why we're not seeing the actual three in here. Um, but it, um, just the thing that points at um, the node is just a pointer. And when, uh, when the linked list is empty, it's a null pointer. The rest of the time, because we know that box is never null, because it always points at valid memory, Rust is doing clever optimization here for us and saying, I can pack these two possibilities of it's either uh, option none or option sum into the same bit of memory as the memory I'm using for the box. Uh, and basically, if, if the box is zero, which can never happen, I know that actually this is the none case. If the box is non-zero, that uh, means, sorry, this, this number is non-zero, that means it's a sum and the number that's in there is a pointer. So it's basically been incredibly clever about understanding the interaction between option and box. And there's quite a lot of these optimizations for um, enums and stuff, like packing multiple things into one place. Um, Rust using its knowledge that box doesn't actually use all of the um, uh, possible values. It uses all the possible values except one, which is zero, right? And box is never a null pointer. And, and we actually only need one in order to represent whether option is none or sum. Um, so it's, it very cleverly packs all that information about the option and the box into one pointer. Um, so it's doing the thing that we did using our scary unsafe code for us completely safely because it, it's really clever, much cleverer than me. Um, so yeah, definitely consider when you're optimizing stuff using pointers, whether maybe there's some smart stuff in the compiler that does it for you and is less likely to make a mistake. Um, so yeah, um, uh, you might be able to avoid unsafe is basically what this is saying. And you should think about it, read the docs, try and find out whether you can. Why? Because um, if you use unsafe code, you might make a mistake and um, it's very unlikely, although not impossible, that the standard library authors and the compiler authors 
make mistakes. And in general, uh, that code is better tested, better thought through, better reviewed than the code we're writing today. So better to use, um, rely on um, the, uh, the processes of creating that code than to write our own, which might have mistakes. All right, so um, next videos, we're gonna work on some exercises that help us understand this a little bit better, including implementing the functions um, for a, a pointer-based link list, uh, try like running external program, uh, and try and do some some clever stuff with results uh, that matches a memory layout we need, maybe for interfacing with some external thing or hardware or something. So exercise the coming where hopefully we'll work through this, um, it'll make more sense. Uh, but just to summarize the whole unsafe discussion so far, right? So Rust is a uh, deep systems language um, where you can do anything you need to do. So it must provide us with unrestricted access to memory and hardware and all that stuff. Also, you can call out to different languages. You can do stuff um, with the operating system. And you must be able to optimize uh, without the compiler getting in the way of so, and saying, no, your code must be slow, right? So Rust lets you optimize as far as you need to and want to. Um, but Rust's goals of being a safe language mean that we do need to we do want it to restrict us from making mistakes in these areas as much as possible. So the answer to that is to do that restriction, keep us safe, but then give us this escape hatch, which is unsafe, uh, which gives us all the power we need, but with the risk of introducing undefined behavior. Uh, we had a quick look at the types of things you can come across in unsafe code, like pointers to things, mutable pointers to things, C strings, maybe uninit. And then we looked at some examples of what it looks like to use unsafe or, or unsafe stuff that we looked at. And then we spent some time talking about whether we should hack around, try to make our own um, unsafe linked list using clever pointers, and then concluded that actually uh, the Rust standard library can do it better than we can anyway, so let's not bother. All right, I um, hope that was helpful. Do ask questions. Um, do correct me if I got things wrong. And uh, see you next time for the exercises.